like to just go right, continue with Q's and A's to try to focus, uh, so Barbara can focus on specific questions. Yes, Tom, let's go here, and then we'll go over here. Sure. I'd like to ask you a question about the OCO. Okay? Yes. Uh, and, and my name is Tom Boya, and among other things, I'm the chair of the uh, study that the American Academy of Diplomacy is just going to the budget for the next four years, five years. And we've looked a little bit at, at the OCO, and you know the question that comes up is, how are you guys going to manage that? Is it slowly going to be reduced and merged into the base budget? Will it be out there as a separate thing for the next four? What? what what's? What's the? Is there a plan? Is sure. Yes. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't know, OCO is our Overseas Contingency Operations Account, and. Uh, when we were originally dealing with the increased costs associated with the frontline states, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, uh, we were continuously going up to the hill with supplemental requests uh, to try and get the additional resources that we need to be able to cover the costs associated with our surge and capacity there. Um, and the administration and Congress were getting continuously frustrated with the fact that there were these supplemental requests. And in effect, what was happening was we were dealing with two budgets in every year. And given the fact that we aren't able to really get one uh, appropriation done at the beginning of a year, that was just a level of complexity that really was not uh, sufficient to be able to get the resources that we needed when we needed them. And so the administration said we, we just can't deal with the supplementals anymore. Congress said we can't deal with the supplementals anymore. And we got kind of looked around and said, all right, how is the Department of Defense dealing with this? They have an OCO account. And they have a, established a separate account that will allow them to request funds to address these sort of critical conflict areas and it will be outside of the regular budget. Um, for the State Department, as we started developing that, we also recognized the fact that unlike the military, we will always have a presence in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and in Pakistan. Once the conflict is resolved, uh, we will continue to have an embassy there. We will continue to have consulates there. So in developing the Overseas Contingency Operation account, what we did was we ensured that we kept a component in our enduring accounts that will allow for ongoing programs in those areas beyond the point which the conflict is resolved. The idea is that we will see uh, in Iraq, you're seeing that we had a large OCO request in FY 2012 that has gone down in 13. The 12 was to uh, address the transition from the military to civilian presence. Um, now that we are hoping to start normalizing things, the funds that we're requesting in OCO will go down. And this is particularly on the state operation side, um, that you will see that it will go up and then down as things start to normalize. And hopefully, at some point, it will go away in Iran. Um, in Afghanistan, in FY13, our request is higher. Can I? Sure, interrupt. What is, the money numbers are going down and people are going down as well. Correct. I, I assume that most of the people are uh, 3161s or other forms of temporary, temporarily assigned people who's, who whose services will no longer be needed. Is that an accurate well, perception? Part of it is also a, a couple of things. Um, our contract will go down, um, and when we're let's just stick with our rock for right now. Um, as we have identified, the security situation is better than we had anticipated. We will be reducing our reliance on contract security guards. As we are trying to utilize the local economy, we will reduce our um, uh, reliance on contracts providing logistic support, food services, uh, uh, bringing food into the country, and instead try and use what is available in country. So we'll be able to reduce the costs associated with the personnel that were doing that, um, as well as the cost of the overall contracts associated with it. 
Um, we will obviously continue to maintain the presence at the embassy that we need to be able to engage with the local personnel, uh, with the government, with the uh, other groups that we will need to continue to operate, just as we would in any other country. Okay. And then the same thing eventually in Afghanistan? Right. In 13, our number is much higher, uh, again, than it was in 12. Because what we're doing is we're starting to move into that transition phase in Afghanistan. And we are trying to work with the Defense Department in identifying, all right, as the Defense Department starts to reduce its presence, what activities does the State Department need to pick up and now have responsibility for? And so there is that increased funding in 13. But then it Right. We are hoping that will go down. And particularly, let, again, let me say, this is, uh, I'm the state operations budget person. Right. And so that's what I'm specifically talking about. On the development side, it's going to be a little bit different because you may see increased costs associated with the development as certain programs are increasing. But there may be offset also by some of the programs such as uh, the, the police training programs and other things. So they, they may offset a bit. Do you have a counterpart in AID that's performing the same function you're performing? Correct. So your question back here. Hi, Jamie Bainucci from DevX. Um, thanks so much for coming today. I actually have kind of a follow-up question about the OPO and funding. Um, we've heard, and there is, I think, a great amount of expectation across the development and diplomacy community that after the transition in Iraq in December, that there would be sort of an immediate need for some of these additional contracts for support services, security, different operations, logistics that were no longer being provided by DOD. Um, but then I've heard a lot of uh, sort of sentiment across the community here in Washington that a lot of those contracts haven't come out. So I wanted to see from your perspective, are there additional sort of uh, probably through OCO new sort of support contracts coming out in the short term and are those mostly sort of la larger logistics contracts or th is there been a sort of a surge in hiring of professional service contractors to fulfill some of this sort of back-end work that's not necessarily core embassy services? Well, in Iraq? In Iraq, and then, I mean, also for Afghanistan. Because we've gone through, we went through um, the uh, uh, renewal of a number of the contracts during the fall time period. Um, and some of those contracts um, actually came in at a lower cost than we had anticipated. Um, and so, as uh, Deputy Secretary Nyes had mentioned, that uh, the request for 13 may be coming down as a result of the fact that the, the contracts were not uh, as high as we had anticipated. Um, will we continue to renew contracts? Yes. Um, obviously, we are going to want to uh, not enter into contracts if we can meet the need with our existing staff. Uh, 3161s are one of the things that have allowed us to operate, be nimble, be flexible, and we will continue to use those where that proves to be the best way to go forward. Um, so it, it's really sort of a mixed bag, and I, I am not a contracting expert, and so I can't speak specifically to any individual contract. Well, contracting experts in the world. Well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll take this one and then over to you. Uh, I'm Herbert Leather, I'm a retired officer. In the recent uh, issue of State Magazine, uh, which I assume you'll look at it anyway. Yes, right. <laughs> I love State Magazine. <laughs> That's interesting. Anyway, the Under Director General's letter, she had a paragraph uh, saying that many more civil service people would be assigned to the field. There was no discussion of why they needed, or there had always been some vote in the field. Do you have any idea what this was all about? What, what are the new gaps abroad that she has to fill with civil service people? because we were never told. Well, I can't speak to how the decision was made. I can tell you what the impetus of the decision was, and that was part of the Secretary's QDDR process. Um, and uh, one of the things that came out of the QDDR was that they wanted to ensure that civil servants were given an opportunity to at least get the flavor of having uh, the ability to serve overseas. Um, and so the um, HR group got together uh, along with, uh, you know, Foreign Service, Civil Service, 
and identified a program where that opportunity would be extended to the civil servants. And uh, that's as much as that uh, I can really speak to. I think you need oh, to yeah, add. I could, well, I could speak a little okay, more to that. I don't want to go into great detail. But I believe, and I didn't read what you were referring to in state magazine, but I think it's probably talking about the pilot program for the um, Civil Service Overseas uh, Development Program, which is a program to help uh, two things. One, a developmental program for those civil servants who are interested in doing what Barbara was just talking about, uh, but also to help the department deal with the mid-level staffing gap, but to do it from within. And it was discussed with AFSA as a kind of pilot. So it's right now on a fairly small scale. Um, and we're working through it to see to what extent it does what it was expected to do and uh, how, how the, the, one of the biggest problems is the re-entry of the civil service people when they come back to their jobs here or not here if those jobs have changed. So, so from my perspective, I mean, it's something that we, we certainly welcome our civil service colleagues learning more about the embassy work, mission, function, the realities. Um, but, you know, I keep thinking that the civil service system or the GS system needs to be kind of really looked at in terms of how it can be made a little bit more flexible and adaptable because otherwise you're not really going to solve the problem by, uh, even to the extent that right now maybe civil service either. It's a site, an add-on to the hard to fill. Um, it's just Has AFSA sent something out on this? I haven't seen that. Uh, we ha it has been, um, you know, briefly uh, described, yeah, Thank it you. has been. We can, we can do more on that. It's still in an early stage. And Susan, there was a department notice. Uh, I don't know that you can get them, but there was a department notice on the newly formed Office of uh, Civil Service. Uh, with uh, Joan. But her, maybe that's a good idea. We'll, we'll try to report a little more on that, you know, yeah. as that's developing. I live in New York, you see, so I only know what you're saying. <laughs> okay, uh, well, we'll, we'll send you more. <laughs> Can you? As someone who used to run a heavily civil service bureau this thing, I strongly support us getting more civil service overseas. We'll be happy to talk about that in the NASA context later. My question uh, for our colleague uh, from the Budget Office is um, within the competition for resources in state as you put together the FY13 budget. How competitive is the training, so-called training flow, that whole effort to try to make sure we've got the resources so that we can not only bring on new people, but train them and our mid-level colleagues so that they can take on the broader responsibilities that everybody agrees we need to. In FY2013, our uh, request includes 122 new positions. Of that, 74 will be in the training flow complement. So this is obviously something that is very much on the forefront of everybody's mind as we're starting to request resources. I don't know what Congress will do. Um, we had a request for, I think, 323 positions in FY 2012. Uh, Congress did not provide for those additional staffing um, in FY 2012. Um, so whether or not that's something that they will include in their 13 marks, I don't know, but uh, obviously the training flow is something that we are taking very seriously, recognizing the fact that if, they, if we have a workforce that isn't trained to do their jobs, then it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for us to have that workforce. So we have one more question. Do we have one more? No? We're all set? All okay. right. That works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Barbara, I don't know if you're on a tight schedule, yeah. too. So, But anyway, thank you all very much. I got a number of ideas here to follow up on. And Barbara, thank you very much oh, well, for thank staying you. around. I appreciate and, uh, it.